before I think anybody does a better job than um, whoever. I don't think it's always the case. Um, so what we're going to look at today, uh, this is material now that, um, oh, sorry. Um, if you wouldn't mind, those of you who are registered, just uh, writing your names on that, that's uh, uh, very helpful, please. So just, so just be registered. Um, this is material that I guess most people don't normally look at. Um, and in fact, it's really interesting. Um, I was just at a conference last week in Heidelberg on, on the encyclopedia. And it was a great conference, and a lot of good people were there. Um, Sally Sedgwick was there, Rob Pippin was there, Dean Moyer, and, and um, really good people from Italy, um, Germany, and you know, from Greece. It was just a, it was a great conference. But it became apparent um, with a number of, uh, you know, even sort of big names, that a lot of them aren't really very interested in the details of what goes on in, in a work like The Logic. They're interested in sort of the big meta issues. Um, and as a consequence, I mean, if you Google or whatever, try and find articles on, you know, Hegel's account of something, Richard Winfield's got a good article uh, on it, but um, there's not a great deal. Um, and, um, but it seems to me that this stuff is really, really important. And what we're going to look at today is particularly important because it contains the seeds of um, uh, Hegel's sort of logical critique of, of, of Kant and Kant's notion of the thing in itself. Um, okay, so what I think I will do is um, I'm just going to give a, <coughs> a brief review of um, where we got to. Uh, and in particular, that, that somewhat difficult transition from um, change into the distinction between being in uh, being in and being proper. Okay, so, uh, so far, in Hegel's account of, of, um, of being and the category of being, and I'm not going to repeat all the time that I take the logic to be doing both metaphysics and logic, etc. Um, being has proven to be not just pure being but to be determinate being. So to be is minimally to be determinate. But it's not just that either. It's to be self-relating, being to be something. And that, as I suggested, doesn't mean that he's saying at this point that being that we began with at the beginning is itself something, but rather to be is to be something. And specifically, it's to be something in relation to something else. It has, it has a negative as well as a, uh, an affirmative uh, character to it. Hegel then examines um, the, what he takes to be the three uh, aspects of uh, something and other. First of all, both something and other are some things, because they're, they're self-relating being. And secondly, they're both other. But Whereas being something has as it were, one dimension to it. It's just being self-related being. Being other has a sort of double character to it. On the one hand, it has that negative moment. It's being other than. So negation involves an implicit relation. So to be other is to be other than. That is the comparative otherness that he refers to on page 117 in the Miller under secondly. So first something and other of it. Some things, secondly, each is equal and equally another, but each because each is equally another insofar as it's other than something else. So if impossibly you took away that first something, then the second one wouldn't be another. It could only be other by comparison. But to be other isn't just relational. It is also the negative form of something. So it is self-relating on its own terms. So it must be considered on its own. That's what he is addressing. And the thirdly, on page 118, um, which sort of finishes off that first section on something and other. So he says, the other can be taken abstractly as another, which it seems to me is partly, is, if you like, Hegel's justification for 
subsequent consideration by often but not exclusively French philosophers of the other as such. How can you consider the other as such? Well, that's not just an artificial abstraction by thought, but in Hegel's view, that's made necessary and permitted by the very structure of being other itself. The other is, on the one hand, other than, but it's also other as such. And yet, in being other as such, it's still being other. And so it involves being other than. Put those two together, and you have the idea that the other as such must be other than itself, the other of itself, the other of the other. And this is what Hegel writes in the last paragraph uh, before we move into number two. So it's 118, 119, uh, and um, page 92 if you're using the uh, uh, teacher Giovanni. So the other simply by itself is the other in its own self, hence the other of itself, and so the other of, it, of the other. That's just another way of saying it's other than itself. As a result of this, it is, he says, absolutely dissimilar with itself, within itself. It is other than the other that it is. And it's other than that, and it's other than that. And so it is the process of being and becoming other than itself. The process, if you like, of self-othering. And as I explained to you last time, uh, the other in German is uh, das andere. Das andere. And you can create a, a noun out of that. Fair anderung, although in fact it should be fair anderung. And so, in the German language, um, at least, there is an intimate connection between change and becoming other. Now, if you're Gadamer, then you think, well, yes, because Hegel gets his concept <laughs> from the word. I don't think that's right, although you have to judge that. I think it's the other way around that. The German expression happily captures the conceptual con uh, connection between being other and change in a way that actually the Latin, I suppose, the alteration does. But change doesn't, unless there's some hidden in etymology there that I don't know. No. Um, just to mention again, although Hegel goes over this extraordinarily briefly, I mean, he, he just says that and then he's on to the next idea. This is very, very important because. Immediately, you can see a contrast between Hegel here and, for example, Kant. Just ask yourself what's missing from Hegel's account of change. Time, for example. No reference to time. Change is comprehensible, intelligible, minimally at least, without reference to time, as simply the process of becoming other than itself. This is not to say that change will not, at some point, prove to involve time. And in fact, change within nature does involve time. But as change, as such, uh, Hegel's arguing here that it doesn't. Similarly, there's no reference to any substrate. Again, I'm thinking about Kant. Uh, indeed, for Kant, in the first analogy, time has to be understood as um, the... Um, well, first of all, as, as the sort of background in relation to which <coughs> change is understood, and because time itself can't be perceived, then we need to think a substrate that represents time. And so change, for Kant, as indeed was the case for Aristotle, becomes the vexel, the sort of alternation of states of an underlying substrate. And you know, you're familiar with that conception of Change. Nothing, there's none of that here at all. So immediately you've got a, 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 an interesting point of contrast. Um, and Hegel is not claiming here that this is the be all and end all. I mean, there's more that one can say about change, but change minimally is comprehensible, simply um, <coughs> on the basis of other. And the last point to, point to note as well is that if Hegel's argument is right here, it's not possible to be something without being subject to change. <coughs> Any something is subject to change. And it's subject to change, again, not because it's in time, not because it's finite, we haven't got that yet, but just by virtue of the fact of being something. 
So, if we encounter things that don't change, either that's got to be an, another dimension of something that we haven't sort of got to yet, and in fact that will be the case, as we'll see in a minute. Or, what it is that we're engaging with isn't something. Okay, but then Hegel moves on very rapidly, as, uh, as I suggested last time, and immediately points out that in the very process of change, in the others becoming other than itself, it remains identical with itself, for that into which it alters is the other, and this is its sole, sole determination. What is altered is not determined in any different way than in the same way, namely to be another. In this latter, therefore, it unites only with its own self. You can see the logic of this, that if change involves becoming other than itself, then change, paradoxically, in fact, involves becoming the same old other, remaining other, continuing to be other. That idea of uniting with itself, as we'll see, is, is important, plays an important role throughout. It's, in the German is, es geht mit sich zusammen. It goes together with itself. So the other becomes other than itself, but in the other that it becomes, it just goes together with itself. And thereby constitutes an identity, an identity that at this point is just a structure of being something. So although every something as other changes, in so doing, it constitutes itself as a self-relating something. In changing, it doesn't cease being a something, it just becomes a new something. But it becomes a something. All of this is derived from this simple idea that something is an other, and the other is on the one hand other than, and on the other hand, another on its own. And therefore, it must be other than itself. So actually, the logic is remarkably simple. But the effects of it are quite um, dramatic. But again, Hegel moves directly on here um, in this last somewhat complicated sentence under one. Um, and this takes us into two, section two on 119. Uh, again, 92 in the in the Bali. And where we're headed, although you know, the logic has got to go imminently, it might help to see you know, where we go. Um, where we're headed is towards the distinction between being in itself and being for other. And the logic clearly is meant to um, demonstrate that the something that arises through the process of change can't any longer just be a mere something. It's got to be a something with this new internal distinction to it. So we're moved on in our understanding of what it is to be something, and we're moved on in particular to understand that something divides its, is divided into what it is in itself, and what it is for another in relation to another. So how does he get there? Well, he gets there in the following sentence, uh, which again, I looked at last time, I'll read it again, but then just sort of go through it more slowly. So this is what he says. It, that's the other, is thus posited as reflected into itself, with sublation of otherness being other and a sign, as a self-identical something, from which consequently the otherness which at the same time a moment of it is distinct, you don't need the other from it, and which does not appertain to the something itself. So we start with the first thought. In this movement of becoming other, in which the other relates to itself, unites with itself, it is thus posited by the very movement of change as reflected into itself with sublation of otherness, of him. So it's reflected into itself in such a way that it stops being merely other. It is the movement of becoming other than itself, but in so doing it relates to itself, and so is a self-identical something, not just another. 
So that's what he's getting with, he's getting out of that point. Only note now that that moment of not just being another is inseparable from being something. So even before we go on and look at the rest of this sentence, you can see that we've already got a slightly different conception of something. Beforehand, if you go back onto page 117, we simply had something and other. There was a comparative moment from the point of view of the other, in that the other was other than, but the something was just something. Yes, it's in relation to another, but that being related to another is built in structurally to being something. This is a peculiar feature of that relation between something and other, that they are logically inseparable, but in such a way that they're separate. Now what we have, at the top of 119, is different. Now we have a something that is a something as the sublation of otherness. So it's not being other is now built into what it means for it to be something. And you've got to see here, this is where it's very important to be able to keep distinct in your mind what we might say about a category and what is built into it explicitly. This was a distinction I didn't dwell on particularly, but Hegel made earlier on page 110 in the section on Dasein. You don't need to look back at it, you can just sort of make a note of it. It was, for those of you using the Giovanni, it's just before B on quality. It's that long paragraph. And the point he's making there is we've got to distinguish between what is for us in our reflection and what is posited in a category. And that is relevant here. So, here, now, not being the other is posited explicitly as a constitutive moment of being something. Where before, we could say of it, there's something that's not the other. But not being the other isn't part of what it is to be something. It's just, something is just something that's separate from the other. And indeed that ability to distinguish what is for us and what is posited in the, log in, in the category is absolutely essential for the whole of the logic. So it's really important that you exercise absolute discipline and rigor in this respect. Otherwise, it will get very confusing. It's confusing enough as it is. But it's very important to keep that uh, clear and indeed, it's the only way, really, to test whether Hegel's being imminent or not. You know, if you're given that Hegel's lot, given that Hegel's just forbidden any external criticism, that's out the window. You can't do it. He's not interested. The only way we can think about even conceivably criticizing what he's doing is imminently, or by catching him out when he's not being imminent. Now, one of the ways that one might think of doing that is by saying, "Aha! Surely." You just said something about this category which hasn't been imminently uh, derived. Fine. Just be very careful that what you're pointing to there is indeed something that is claimed to be explicit in the category, and not just a description that we're using that Hegel's well aware is merely our reflection. So that distinction between us and the matter at hand doesn't just belong to the phenomenology. We're familiar in the phenomenology between what the object is in itself and what it is, as it were, for us, the phenomenologists. And it's tempting to think, actually, we don't have that distinction anymore in the logic, but we do. Which is why Hegel allows himself to make all these anticipatory remarks, all these reflections on what's going on, as well as attending to the details at hand. Anyway, sorry, that was just a long little digression, but I think it's important to keep that in mind. So what we have now is something that is explicitly something as the sublation of others, as not being the other. Okay, so he continues in this sentence. It's posited as a self-identical something, well that's just saying again what reflected into itself the same, from which consequently otherness is distinct and does not appertain to the something, 
But, if we go back to the little subordinate clause, which is at the same time a moment of it. So you've got those two aspects of the other. The moment of otherness is distinct from the something, but it's a moment of the something. And it's both of them by virtue of the fact that the something is a something, not the other. So what Hegel's claiming here is that in that idea of not being the other, you have combined into one thought both distincted, distinction and connection. So if A is not B explicitly, then A is not B. B is distinct from A, but A is connected to B via the negation. Once you've got that idea, then you can see, basically, how he now will derive from this being in itself and being for other. So insofar as this something that emerges is a self as not the other, as a sublation of the other, insofar as it is the self as something not the other, it's the something in itself, and Z. That distinguishes it from the other. But insofar as that not, that moment of sublation, connects the two, it's something, not the other. Then it binds the something to the other. That's the connection. That's the moment of being for other. Where for just means related to. Hegel uses the word for in a similar way to fichte. It just means being related to. And, and I think I've said before, but if it didn't get across, Hegel is very careful in his use of prepositions. And they all tend to mean something. In, an, für, uh, and so on. So again, just so it's clear, the thought is this, that through this process that he's setting out in this last paragraph, the other becomes the other of itself, changes. In so doing, it just relates to itself, and so constitutes itself as something, as a something that is not just other. And in that idea of not just being other, of being the sublation of otherness, the something proves to have these two sides to it. It's something not the other, it's distinct from the other, it's something in itself. But it's something not the other. And so it has the connection to the other in it. And so it's something for other. So according to Hegel, the something that emerges at this point has to have those two sides to it. I think if you understand it that way, it's not quite as bad as when you first read the sentence. Although I have to admit, it would be, you know, as so often with Abel, another sort of couple of paragraphs explaining all of this, uh, would not have gone amiss. Okay, so now let's move on and look more closely uh, at, um, we don't need to look at actually everything that's said here, but, but what Hegel understands by these two terms. So he first of all gives us a sort of a generic paragraph uh, that runs as follows. Oh, this is in the Miller, uh, number two. Something preserves itself, that's again just is reflecting into itself, is something. In, it should be in its negative determinant being. The Giovanni has in its non-being, which I guess is okay, although strictly speaking non-being would be nicht sein. The phrase is in seinem nicht da sein. Now we haven't really had that before. Nicht da sein. Dasein was the word for determinate being. What that proved to be was something. So something in the form of the nicht is just the other. So actually, what Abel's saying there is something preserves itself in its otherness. It is essentially one with it, and essentially not one with it. Those, that's the ambiguity. It stands, therefore, in a relation to its otherness, and is not simply its otherness. The otherness is at once contained in it and also still separate from it. It, i.e. the something, is a being for other. Sein für anderes. Now this, this is a very good example of Hegel coining a phrase that really is couldn't be simpler. Sein is just the word for being, for, another. 
So note that Hegel doesn't coin some complex Latinate term. He's not Kant. And, uh, and indeed, you get in Adorno too often sort of highly unusual language that kind of alienates you. What Hegel's trying to do, remember, Hegel famously said in a letter that he was trying to teach philosophy to speak German, much as Luther had done for uh, faith. And so this is an example of that. You've got a logical structure. The name he gives is meant to just present that structure as simply as possible. It's Zeit, it's a way of being, that is related to, if you just think of Führer as being related to another, without further specifying what that um, uh, Führer really uh, means in, in detail. We don't need to know that yet. Um, but it binds those two together. So that's one aspect. So it means, before we go on to um, uh, being in itself, that other relatedness is an inherent feature of being something. It still remains the case that insofar as you think of something just as something by itself, then it will be another only insofar as it put next to something else. So if I take these two and think of them just as something for a minute, then obviously if that's something, that's something else other than that. But if I take that away and that's the only thing we've got, it's not other than anything. But now at this point, something can't just be thought of as something by itself. It has to be thought of as being other related itself. So other relatedness is built into its very structure. So that gets the idea of connection in something not another. But what about the idea of difference in something not another? Well, that's brought out in, I'm going to skip the next paragraph, the, the term being, because it's just, you know, you can see it just uh, uh, ends up with being for other again. But if we go to the following one, um, uh, Hegel gets us to being in itself. So it, something, preserves itself in its Nicht-Dasein again, and is being, not being in general, being in general, but well, it should be um, sein überhaupt, being as such, is a better translation. Not being as such that we had at the beginning of the logic, but as self-related in opposition to its relation to another, as self-equal in opposition to its inequality. Such a being is being in itself. So being in itself, which is an sich sein, not in sich sein, is the counterpart to this. Remember that being something at all was in sich sein, or which Miller translates as being within itself, which is just having the very structure of, as it were, like an interiority. Having an interior space as such is an in sich sein, and that's the basic structure of being something. Dasein doesn't have this yet because Dasein is, is too simple too underdeveloped. And Zion certainly doesn't have it yet. Although yet yeah, we can we can possibly say of Zion being that it's empty within, but of course it doesn't explicitly have a within, so it's not a very informative thing to say. Um, but this does have a within, in fact it's a space of being within. But Anzig sign is different from Inzig sign. Anzig sign is one of a pair. And the language that Hegel uses there of opposition should remind you now of the relationship that held between reality and negation. Reality and negation were two sides of a single difference. Something and other were just separate. Now we have again two sides of a single difference. But we have something in these two aspects. So. What is happening here? Well, what's happening is that something is becoming determinate. Now, that means nothing unless you've distinguished being determinate from being something in the first place. So, all of this early stuff, although I admit it's not you know, as exciting as some of the stuff that comes later, is important. Hegel distinguishes simply being from being determinate from being something. And what he's now arguing is that actually to be something itself involves being something determinate. And this is the first form of it. 
and the last form of it will be something with a limit. So we're really looking now at the development of the thought that being is something uh, is something determined, or to be is to be something determined. Um, all right, now, um, before he goes on with this, first of all, note the fact that Hegel thinks that this is not a fiction. To be something is to have an intrinsic being. So he's not going to come along and say, we need to, this is a fiction, just get rid of it. You can't just get rid of it. And the fact that something is itself other related doesn't mean that it can't have an intrinsic being. Although some philosophers apparently think that it does. Not, not for Hegel. You can, that something has to have two aspects. In the next paragraph, then, Hegel just notes that there is a, a logical difference between the first pair, something and other, and this pair. So this is what he says. Being for other and being in itself constitute the two moments of the something. There are here present two pairs of determinations. One, something and other. Two, being for other and being in itself. The former, something and other, contain the unrelatedness of their determinants. So in that sense, they're not really determined properly. They're unrelated, they're separate. You can't have something without other, but what it is to be something is to stand apart from its other. That's the separateness. In that sense, it's unrelated. Their relation is one of unrelatedness. A thought, by the way, that will come back later when we get to the one and the many. And so he goes on, there's something and other fall apart. But their truth is their relation, being for other and being in itself, are therefore the above determinations posited as moments of one and the same something, as determinations which are relations and which remain in their unity, the unity of determinate being. Each, therefore, at the same time, contains within itself its other moment, which is distinguished from it. So, whereas something and other fall apart, being in itself and being for other are moments of one and the same something. So, don't think of these two aspects of something as being something and something else. The intrinsic being of something isn't something other than its other relatedness. That's a category mistake, although we often do that. In fact, when you're thinking about Kant, if you, think, if you, if you don't take the two-world interpretation of Kant, but you take the kind of two different kind of object interpretation of Kant, then that's what a lot of people do, is they make that into something other than that. But it's not, logically. These are moments within a single something. As such, each contains within itself its other, which is distinguished from it, because each is one of a pair. Each refers to the other. It doesn't make sense, Hegel's claiming, to think of something's intrinsic being, antic sign, except in relation to and in contrast with the way it relates to others. This is what it is in itself as opposed to the way it relates to others. This is the way it relates to others as opposed to what it is in itself. They form a pair, they're inseparable. And in that sense, each refers to the other explicitly. Okay, um, all right, I'm going to skip uh, the next paragraph and then look at the, uh, uh, there's another, there's the, the, the two after that, the two that lead up to three, which is where he comments in more detail on being in itself and being for other, and brings out this, this aspect of relatedness uh, in the two of them. And the first paragraph that begins, hence being in itself, which is... Um, yeah, hence being itself is translated in the same way by, uh, by the duality. I think it's really, really interesting because it brings out a nuance in the idea of being itself um, that is, um, it perhaps hasn't been uh, highlighted yet. So what, this is what Hegel says. Hence being in itself is first a negative relation to the negative determinate being. It's a negative relation to otherness. It has the otherness outside it and is opposed to it. Insofar as something is in itself, 
It is withdrawn from otherness and being for other. The word is ethnomen, sort of almost sort of taken out of. This is the undersign ethnomen. Now that idea of being withdrawn is really important. So what Hegel's saying is that built into the very idea of something being what it is in itself, and Z, is the idea of it withdrawing back into itself from its relations to others. So on the one hand, that idea of withdrawal takes what something is in itself out of the sphere of relation. In one sense, you could say, well, what something is in itself is what it is within itself, withdrawn from any relation to something else. But that withdrawal is itself a concealed relation, a concealed negation. Now you can see very clearly how Anzig sign differs from Inzig sign. Inzig sign, just being something, isn't withdrawn from anything. It's just self relation <coughs> It's just itself. But what something is intrinsically is withdrawn back into itself from that. So it's a peculiar combination of a certain kind of separateness with an implied negation of that. But it's only sort of implied. It's sort of, sort of concealed negation. But Hegel's fascinated by various ways in which negation can be more or less explicit. And here, negation is more explicit than it is there, but it's also contained and sort of veiled almost within the withdrawal of the thing back into itself. And obviously, um, the word is, is as an ethnomen, so taken away from. Uh, but the withdrawal, I think, is... Uh, uh, it's quite a good uh, translation. So that's the first thing he says. <coughs> but then he goes on and immediately points out the consequence of this. But secondly, <coughs> it is being in itself also has present in it non-being in itself. For it is the non-being of being for other. So in fact, there's a more explicit negation in being in itself. Being in itself is not the other relatedness of the thing. It's got that twofold not in it. It's, it's, it's implicitly not other relatedness in being withdrawn back into itself, and it is, in fact, not other relatedness. So it's not pure being. Intrinsic being, Anzig sign, isn't purely positive, precisely by virtue of the contrast with being for other. So in that sense, they're, they're, they're bound together as two moments of, uh, of one. But then being for other is also relational in the same way. So he goes on, being for other is first a negation of the simple relation of being to itself, so negation of uh, antic sign, which in the first instance is supposed to be determined of being in something, insofar as something is in an other or is for another, it lacks a being of its own. To think of something here as being for another, being other related, is at least initially to contrast it with what it is in itself. This is what it is in relation to something else, this is what it is in itself. So the implication of that is that insofar as you think of it in its relation to something else, it lacks intrinsic being. It lacks intrinsic being because surely intrinsic being belongs to it, not to something else. But being other related puts it in relation to something else. How something is in relation to something else isn't what it is intrinsically, at least initially. So, insofar as something is in another or is for another, it lacks a being of its own. But secondly, it is not negative determined being as, some, as pure nothing. It is negative Dasein, which points to being in itself as to its own being. So in fact, when you think of something as what it is in relation to something else, that refers back to the idea that the thing has its own intrinsic identity too, as well. So each, each is related to the other. They are inseparable to Sani is better. Not within it, but in it. So cross out the with. Those of you who've got the Digivani, I think you've got, he's done a good job there. Seems to me. Maybe I've understood this right. 
except the Jirani has a weather in there, which isn't really right either. Something also has a determination or substance, substance, uh, circumstance in itself or in it. He's not saying whether one or the other. In fact, what he's suggesting is that they are in fact the same. They coincide. It's just... Etwas hat aber auch eine Bestimmung oder unter Umstand an sich oder an ihm. I'll come to that in a minute. So something has in itself or in it a determination or circumstance insofar as this circumstance is outwardly in it is a being for other. So something in itself is withdrawn from its being for other but on the other hand, whatever something is in itself is in its being for other, because it's one and the same something. Okay, now you need to know a little bit of the uh, of the um, of the German for this uh, to help you on your on your way. And the translators, I think, <coughs> Di Giovanni does a slightly better job than the Miller. Um, but there's a difference between an sich and an im. An is just the word they're translating as in, which is fine, although you can also sit an a table, for example, so at. An can be translated as it or at, as at or, uh, or in. Sich is the reflexive pronoun, as in oneself. Im is what I guess you might call a sort of an objective pronoun, masculine or neuter, in the dative case. Why is that important? Well, it's important because of the idea of a circumstance being outwardly in it. Interesting idea. How can something be outwardly in something? Well, something is outwardly in something if it's in it, as it were, from an objective point of view. Now, I hesitate introducing the idea of a, a third point of view because I don't want you to be sort of worried about the sort of other observers here. The point is that when something is an sich, it belongs to the thing in relation to itself. And it's withdrawn back into itself. When something is an im, it belongs to the thing, but outwardly, for another. So, what Hegel will describe as an im sein just is sein für anderes. It's just another expression for the same thing. To, set, to talk about the thing's other relatedness is to talk about what the thing is, not an sich, but an im. So what he's saying here, and this is where, even, although Di Giovanni does a better job by translating an im as in it, rather than within it, within it is, thinks, makes you think you're back at um sich sein. He obscures the fact that Hegel is actually saying these two are the same, by introducing a weather. Because weather, suggests, well, there's this or there's that. That's not Hegel's point. Hegel's point is, the one is in fact the other. But something also has in itself an sich, or in it an im, a determination or circumstance insofar as this circumstance is outwardly in it, is a being for other. So we know already there that being in itself and being for other, in fact, are the same. What something is in itself, it is for another. And what it is for another, it is in itself. Why? Because they are moments of one and the same... They're, they're not something and something else. They're one and the same something in its two aspects. Now he goes on and makes it explicit in the next paragraph and then uh, shows you something of the um, significance of this. So he says, this leads to a further determination. Being in itself and being for other are in the first instance distinct, but that something has in it an in, again, cross out the with, the same character that it is in itself. And conversely, that what it is as being for other, it also is in itself. This is the identity of being in itself and being for other, in accordance with the determination that something itself is one and the same something of both moments, which therefore are undividedly present in it. Then he goes on and points to later part of the logic, where this same idea uh, is um, presented. This identity is already formally given in the sphere of determinate being, but more expressly in the consideration of essence and of the relation of inner and outer. 
and most precisely in the consideration of the idea as the unity of notion and actuality. So, if what something is in itself is what it is for others, then how would that work out, how would that uh, manifest itself in the relation of the inner and the outer? Well, it means that the inner expresses itself. And what is expressed is the inner. Or, um, James, if you'll forgive uh, what I'm about to say, my uh, lecturer when I was an undergraduate was uh, Duncan Forbes, who was a very proud scholar. He was a brilliant man, very brilliant man. And he used to like quoting what I think was Burns, anyway. But the phrase that came out, forgive my terrible accent, was something like this. If it's in, it'll oot. Exactly. If it's in, it'll out itself. It'll utter itself. The inner outs itself. That is exactly the point he's getting at. And that is essential to all of Hegel. It might do itself, might do that in a hidden way, it might do it in an overt way. And that's really, and that's perhaps not what you were expecting. Having got that distinction between being in itself and being for other, now Hegel says <coughs> the distinction holds. There is a distinction between what something is and the way it relates to other things. It's just the way it relates to other things is the relation of what it is in itself. And what it is in itself manifests itself in its relation to others. This is partly why Hegel is not a great believer in hiddenness, secrecy. Look at Kierkegaard. Look at Derrida. Think of the importance of secrecy. Hegel's view is you can try and be as secret as you want, but if it's in, it'll oot. The very attempt to try and be secret will reveal itself. How do you think lie detectors work? How do you think Darren Brown does what he does? Because try and hide it, it will manifest itself in some way or another. Even if it's only in a brain scan. You try and, you know, Think a secret thought, it will show up. So obviously he's not denying that if I barricade myself in my room and keep quiet, you know, you don't know what's going on. I mean, not denying that. But, but philosophically, things don't have an internal secret hidden heart that is purely private and secret. Because what things are manifests itself. And this is one of those points, you'll either like it or you won't like it. If you like secrecy, you're not going to like Hegel. But remember, also this gets carried over into his philosophy of religion. What is the Christian God? Just the very revealing that truth consists in revelation. You know, Derrida and Kierkegaard both take issue with this by emphasizing the importance of secrecy. Um, anyway, I just... Um, as well, and you should also be able to see now the implication of this for Kant, which I'll come to in... Uh, in uh, uh, actually, well, I think I'll come to straight away now. Um, all right, so... This idea provides the logical ground for a critique of Kant. But we've got to be careful here, because obviously Kant's distinction between uh, appearances and things as they might be in themselves is not principally a logical one, it's an epistemic one. So, well, it's got to be careful how you bring these together. Um, just, Hegel has a lot to say about Kant himself in the logic and in the encyclopedia. Not all of which is fair, I have to admit. So let's take what I take to be the real Kant. And I don't know where you come from, but I have to say, I mean, I, I generally uh, am uh, a card-carrying, paid-up follower of the uh, Henry Allison Appreciation Society. It seems to me Allison understands Kant uh, better than anybody else does, uh, although Paul Gower and others have good criticisms. So that may or may not be true, but, 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 but Allison is the one that I'm guided by. On that interpretation, the idea of the thing in itself is just a correlate of the idea that the forms of intuition are so if you take the idea that <coughs> experience and the objects of experience are conditioned by a priori forms of intuition, 
And then if you plug in Kant's assumption, which he never justifies, which is that what is a priori can only have its source in the subject. If it's a priori, you can't get it from the object, because what you get from the object can only be a posteriori. Ergo, what's a priori must be subjective. Therefore, the forms of intuition are subjective, albeit universal for being like us. They're not individually subjective. They're universally subjective. But they're subjective. Then that means that any experience that we have of objects mediated by those forms is only going to be an experience of things as they manifest themselves within those forms of, of intuition. But the logical correlate of that, Kant says, is that you must be able to distinguish the way that things are in appearance, the way they are for us, I've taken off the board, but you know what I mean, from the way they are in themselves. That's not to say that we have any access to things in themselves or that we can even know that there are. And so whatever Kant does say, Kant is not allowed to say things in themselves exist. And to my knowledge, for the most part, he never says that. He talks about what things might be in themselves and so on. The thing in itself is a posit of thought that is the correlate of the very idea of the limitation of the forms of experience. So my Kant is much closer to Fichte, for example, than, than some. You know, Fichte also says, thing itself is a positive thought. Kant said, well, yeah, obviously, we know that. It's thought by the understanding in order to make sense of the limits of, um, of, uh, of uh, the forms of intuition. So it's an epistemic notion. Now, what Hegel's doing here in the logic is not transcendental philosophy. He's not articulating the conditions of experience. He's giving you a logic. But the logic <coughs> argues, if it's right, that you can't separate the thing in itself from the way the thing is for others. So how do we bring that to bear on Kant's epistemic position? For Kant, the thing in itself is precisely the thing abstracted from the conditions under which it's known. But Hegel's saying that abstraction is actually logically unsustainable. It is precisely the product of an abstraction. It has no truth. In truth, what things are in themselves shows itself, manifests itself, in the way it is for others. So Hegel will come back to Kant and say, Kant, I'm not disputing the idea that things have an intrinsic being. It's just whatever they are intrinsically must show itself for others. It must manifest itself for others. May not Maybe not purely, but it will do so. The cat denies that. There is, in the realm of experience for Kant, nothing, absolutely nothing, of what the things are in themselves, for two reasons. First of all, the pure forms of intuition are subjective. Secondly, the empirical element is a product of our being affected by things. And at no point does Kant say does that empirical element in any way resemble the objects that affect us. So it's as if the empirical sensory content that we have is all, without exception, light lock secondary uh, perceptions of secondary qualities. So there's no resemblance. So there's nothing for Kant of what the thing is in itself that manifests itself in appearance. Hegel says that is logically incoherent. If you mean anti-sign, it's sustainable only through an abstraction. Now, I think that's quite a powerful argument. And no doubt Kantians can come back. But how can they come back? All they can come back to argue is that, yes, the abstraction is necessary. But then we go to the logic, and people can say, no, it's not only being itself is necessary, but the conception of being itself with which the Kantians operate is unsustainable. Um, Kant is subjected to other criticisms by Hegel elsewhere. Um, and what I've just said goes beyond what Hegel himself says, because I don't think Hegel takes account fairly of the epistemic character of, the, of Kant's notion. So I was trying to do that, as it were, to do justice to the Kantians. 
But even then, it seems to me, Kant's um, position is under threat. Okay, let's just read what Hegel himself says, and then you can make your own judgment about whether I've gone too far. So, in the next paragraph, Hegel writes, um, it may be observed that the meaning of the thing in itself is here revealed. It is a very simple abstraction, but for some while it counted as a very important determination, something superior, as it were, just as the proposition that we do not know what things are in themselves ranked as a profound piece of wisdom. Things are called in themselves insofar as abstraction is made from all being for other, for all appearance. Which simply means insofar as they are thought devoid of all determination as nothing. That's Hegel's classic complaint against the notion of the thing in itself. Is that it's so abstract that it's nothing. That's not completely fair because that's not what Kant says. Kant thinks that, and in fact actually it's belied somewhat by Hegel's just account we've just looked at. The notion of Anzigstein isn't just nothing. It's something as it is in itself, but leave that to one side. In this sense, of course it's impossible to know what the thing in itself is, but the question what demands that determinations be assigned, but since the things of which they are to be assigned are at the same time supposed to be things in themselves, which means in effect to be without any determination, the question is thoughtlessly made impossible to answer, or else only an absurd answer is given. Actually, I like that, I mean, even though I, I slightly disagree with what he's saying about the thing in itself, I like that idea that it's possible to pose a question which makes itself thoughtlessly impossible to answer. Bear that in mind in the future. You know, it's, it's a very helpful thought. Not all the questions we put are properly po posable. Um, and then he goes on, though, to say the thing in itself is the same as that absolute of which we know nothing except that in it all is one. What is in these things in themselves, therefore, we know quite well. They are as such nothing but truthless, empty abstractions. Then he switches to his own more positive view. What, however, the thing in itself is in truth, what is truly in itself, of this logic is the exposition. And it will go on to, to, to prove to be actuality, concept, idea, geist. The very last paragraph, which is the, I, I, I won't look at but just draw your attention to, um, indicates another way in which we can understand this idea of the thing in its, of, of being in itself, and that is in contrast to the notion of positive. So, before, in the section on Dasein, we had the distinction between what we understand something to be in our reflection and what it is, as it were, positive explicitly. Now, he says, we must remember that there can be a distinction between what a concept or a phenomenon is in itself, and sich, and what it is explicitly, an und für sich. But of course, we can only make that distinction in a sense retrospectively. So when you've got something as mere in sich sein, that's all you've got. You don't know that that is just an implicit version of what will come later as the finite thing. When you've got the finite thing, you can look back at this, something, and say, well, that was really just sort of an sich, a finite thing. Whereas a finite thing as finite thing is explicitly itself. So the an sich and the für sich, or the an and für sich, <coughs> map onto effectively implicit and explicit, which is why often an sich side is translated as implicit being, intrinsic being. That's not the distinction that's being drawn here. Hegel's just showing the way that the concept can be used. All right, it's five past. I suggest we have a short break.